To me, Red Steel is one of the most compelling Wii games ever made, and not because it's especially competent. It's not. It's a very flawed FPS game that's widely been remembered as a disappointment for valid reasons, but there are certain things it does, and certain things it tries, that just endear me to it. There's something alluring about how it tried to reframe how you interact with FPS games, and there's a broad sense that Red Steel had an ambition that few games do. Red Steel's trailer will always stick with me. I, I remember where I was when I first saw it. Like, it was on repeat on a TV screen in a food court in Castle Towers, which is like a suburban shopping centre in northwest Sydney. My then time crisis obsessed brain was fixated. Like, Red Steel was shaping up to be my dream game, taking what looks like Time Crisis's light gun aiming and plugging it into a first person shooter. It's Time Crisis, but you can move, like, what could possibly go wrong? Red Steel was a Wii launch game, it was quickly shaping up to be one of the key games in the Wii's launch lineup, and so its trailers aired before the Wii came out. And the specific mix of everyone not fully knowing the Wii's limitations, all the marketing, Red Steel's contemporary aesthetic, and the then popularity of FPS games all melted together to form a lot of hype. Where Nintendo's first party games were concerned with representing the TV remote-esque Wiimote as a more family-friendly tennis racket, or a bowling ball, or a fishing rod, it wasn't at all a stretch to imagine it as a gun or a sword here in Ubisoft's less family-friendly launch title. Red Steel's very concept seemed to fit the Wii like a glove. Aesthetically, it was cutting edge, and importantly, on a system that was quickly setting its sights on a more casual market, Red Steel was for the video game enthusiast. This and Twilight Princess were looking to be the two launch lineup standouts for enthusiasts, and Red Steel especially really felt like a main comparison point with the type of games you'd see a lot more of on the PS3 and 360. There was also plenty of rational scepticism surrounding Red Steel. A playable demo at E3 2006 wasn't exactly well received by the press, to the point where the devs did a bit of damage control and tried to explain away what went wrong there. But if you were looking in from the outside with a sort of starry-eyed optimism like the Time Crisis nerd I was did, this looked to deliver on a whole new level of immersion if it did actually feel as intuitive as its trailers were trying their best to convince you it would. Like, look at our 2006 dude here just getting into it. He's so animated, he's dodging gunfire, he's standing up for a sword fight. At one point he shoots a fish tank and gets soaked by water in real life. Amazing. I filmed myself playing the game, excuse the moustache, to see what it looked like and yeah, not quite the same. Uh, slight wrist movements are enough to aim anywhere on the screen and reloading takes a small flick of the nunchuck, which also opens doors, picks up weapons, serves as the action button, and as the context sensitive melee attack. You can see how that becomes a problem pretty quick. Uh, the most animated I got was for the sword fights, which I gladly remained seated for, and most enemies can be cheesed by just waggling the Wiimote as fast as possible. I'll now throw you over to me for more on the controls. To lock on in Red Steel, you press the A button, which will kind of slowly shift the camera to center the enemy that you're locked onto, and you kind of have to like follow the camera with your own aim to keep aiming at what you want to look at. You kind of have to like counteract it with your aim, which feels incredibly awkward, and uh, the locking on in general just feels so awkward that you won't want to do it. And equally awkward is you can sort of zoom in with any gun, and the way you do that is sort of this, you do this big long motion like this. You kind of like extend your arm out all the way, uh, and the problem is any slight movement of your wrist while you're moving will translate into a really like big movement of the cursor on the screen. So you kind of need to keep it really still, and to keep it really still you need to do it really slowly, uh, and it just becomes a mechanic that you'll never want to use because of that. Uh, another thing that's awkward is you press left on the D-pad to aim. Uh, sorry, to switch weapons. So while you're aiming, you, you, you move your thumb up to press left on the D-pad, and just that slight movement like that, uh, just doing that kind of tilts the Wiimote down slightly, and that translates to a pretty big shift in your cursor on the screen, and suddenly you're trying to switch weapon, but you're looking at the floor. Like, maybe if you have really big thumbs or really big hands or whatever, it's fine. But uh, whenever you're switching weapons, you kind of need to do it in a really considered way. I actually found myself 
using my left hand holding the nunchuck to come over and press it sometimes, which is incredibly stupid. Um, and just generally, I think that the, the effect the controls had were the exact opposite of what the developers intended, you know? They, they kind of wanted you to pick up a controller and immediately it feels like a gun or a sword. Um, but instead what happened is people picked up the controller and immediately hated it. It felt wrong. People didn't like it. I, I literally know people who played this game for, you know, one minute and just said, I can't do this, I'm not playing this, uh, which is understandable. But um, I will say that if you can put up with it, you, you, do, you do get used to it at some point. And uh, I think showing video footage of the game in this video will make it look like my cursor's flying around on the screen and everything's just waving around. But when you're playing it, it, the controls do fade away to some extent after you've got used to them. You know, it's, it's, it's really not as bad as it looks, um, but it's not great either. And you'll keep hitting these sort of awkward moments when you try and zoom in or switch weapons. So it's awkward. And uh, back to you, me. Thanks for that, me. The guns in Red Steel shoot like cannons. They're so loud. They send enemies ragdolling. They leave massive bullet holes and they break everything around you. They might not feel good to aim, but they feel good to simply shoot. When the controls aren't getting too in the way and you're just blasting down dozens of bad guys with a shotgun in a nightclub or in a Matrix lobby scene room, because of course this has one of those, it can all harmonize surprisingly well. Or at least it can if you have the patience to learn these controls, which is a big if. Pro tip, pick up a shotgun whenever you can. There. A blast, literally. Sometimes you'll automatically put away your gun and get out a sword for a duel, and everyone is polite enough to stop shooting at you, apparently, and these are just game design gibberish. When you're not endlessly hacking away, which you can do the majority of the time, you gotta time parries and dodges and try to do special attacks and combos. Uh, the problem is, the Wiimote and Nunchuck just aren't responsive enough for any of this to feel good, or even to work properly. Sometimes your Nunchuck parry just won't activate, sometimes your sword swing will happen a couple of seconds after you swing, and it feels like you'll never have a big enough opening to pull off a combo. It demands timing and precision that the controls simply can't provide. And neither can the visuals, apparently. Red Steel barely hits its 30 frames per second target, sometimes dipping below 20. It's sticky and it impacts the Wiimote aiming the most. For a game tracking the slightest of wrist movements and rotations, not having a smooth frame rate is awkward. How it freezes up for checkpoints every couple of minutes doesn't help, nor do the long loading screens. For a game that strives to have seamless and direct control that immerses you in its world, it just keeps shooting itself in the foot, something you'll accidentally be doing a lot of in Red Steel. So Red Steel didn't reach the unprecedented levels of immersion that its marketing team tried to make you believe it would. The critical and audience responses reflect that, and the TV screen in that food court in 2006 lied to me. Water didn't splash over me at all while I was playing. I'm taking this all the way to my Prime Minister. But I think Red Steel's reputation as a letdown has cast a shadow over the things it does really, really well. Things that, despite all its issues, make me kind of adore this game, and most of those things are tied to its atmosphere, to its vibe, to its aesthetics, the, the kind of things that are a little harder to measure. Red Steel is mostly set in Tokyo, and between missions you hang out at two hub areas. One is a traditional Japanese dojo where you can practice your sword fighting. The music is very serene and very traditional, as is the architecture. Lots of timber, lots of religious imagery, shrines, gardens, statues, rivers, bamboo. Uh, there's, a, there's a flow and a precision to how it all looks, a, a focus on tradition and nature and an immaculate paradise-like sort of beauty to it all, or paradisiacal, if you will, which I just learnt is a word. The other hub area is a nightclub, with a shooting range and a group of gangsters you can take missions from, and it's the opposite. It's dark smoky rooms, metal panels, artificial lighting, an elevator. There's an industrial look to it all that blends, you know, contemporary architectural influences in a modern, more pragmatic and space-efficient way. Like rooms are small and busy on the eyes, harsh in all the ways the dojo isn't. On the one hand, you have the serene, careful, and traditional aesthetics to represent the katana, and on the other you have the bold, abrasive, and modern to represent the gun. Practice swordplay at the dojo, and your aim at the club. 
At the very core of Red Steel's visual language and at the core of Red Steel's gameplay are these two opposites. The sword and the gun, the traditional and the modern, the tranquil and the jarring. Seeing massive boxy skyscrapers towering over the dojo's garden or seeing its gate lead onto a dingy concrete street is evocative, as is having a traditional meeting room inside the modern nightclub. Red Steel loves using this juxtaposition as much as it can, and the art team pulls it off in such a stylish and stunning way. There were multiple times where I just stopped to slow pan around and take it all in. You'll be fighting through a fancy marble lobby of an office building, for example, and then through its cubicles and office desks with vending machines and printers everywhere, blowing up everything with your cannon-like guns, until suddenly you turn a corner onto its traditional rooftop garden, surrounded by greenery and a gate and god rays shining down, where you'll be greeted by a low-flying passenger jet overhead and its roaring engines. Like, nightclubs will lead into shrines, warehouses, into bathhouses. It's very dynamic and you always feel like there's something new and interesting around the next corner. The soundtrack by Tom Salter follows suit. It's eclectic, weaving between genres and influences, back and forth between traditional and modern, electronic mixed with live recorded instrumentals. I'll play you a few seconds from different parts of the game and listen to how great a job the sound designers did too. It all sounds so punchy and it helps sculpt some impeccable vibes. This soundtrack won awards, it pipes up at all the right times, and I couldn't imagine Red Steel scored to anything else. Everything here just clicks aesthetically, even the main menu oozes style. This clashing duality of Red Steel's two major themes permeate through every part of the game. The visuals, the soundtrack, the gameplay, the locations, they're, they're all on the same wavelength here, in a way that you don't see often. And when Red Steel is firing on all cylinders, at least as much as it can with these controls, there's a remarkable beauty to it. Like, look at this waterfront sunset looking off of a cliffside modern Japanese house. Or look at this lightning storm set over this reflective balcony as light casts through. It's gorgeous, and there's something to say about how the very 2006 heavy use of fog effects and glass effects and water effects and volumetric lighting and bloom, it, it's purely taste, but there's a glowy, chunky, lo-fi look to it all that I find very radiant, especially on a CRT TV. Tokyo itself, as in the city of Tokyo in real life, blends a lot of tradition into its sprawling modern metropolis too, which adds to Red Steel's cohesion. Like, Tokyo is the perfect city to run these two themes alongside each other. The realism of this setting isn't compromised to cater for the aesthetics here, and things like how shrines are tucked away between high-rises is one of the more striking things about the city from a Western perspective. And Red Steel is very much designed from a Western perspective, like pre-release developer interviews with Ubisoft Paris will admit as much. This isn't a nuanced commentary on Japan or its culture, it's more of an homage to Japanese cinema and imagery, like Japan is treated more as an aesthetic, in a similar way to something like Kill Bill treats Japan. It's, it's a backdrop for cool action scenes and cheesy storytelling. You could say that this is style over substance, I suppose, but when the style is this enjoyable, it kind of becomes the substance. I, yeah, I don't like that phrase anyway. Red Steel's unsophisticated, crowd-pleaser, sophomoric storytelling approach is made more than clear from the moment you start the game and are treated to its remarkably stupid, you are an American who needs to save your beautiful girlfriend from the Yakuza story. Bad voice acting, overlong, poorly animated close-up dialogue sequences that you can't skip, cringeworthy stereotypes, and cheap storyboard cutscenes drag down what could be a fun, pulpy revenge story. And 
The nuance and the style that Red Steel's aesthetics pull off aren't matched by the storytelling. There's some potentially fun beats here, but the execution isn't. Somewhere around the 20th time an enemy calls you a bloody gaijin, you'll start to clock out. One of the funniest things about this game to me is how after every sword fight you're given the option to either kill or spare your opponent, yet in between sword fights you're just sort of thoughtlessly murdering hundreds of people. Like, our silent protagonist is a complete psycho. He's often the one attacking first, sometimes you're just surprising scientists or workers by shooting them in the back of the head, but oh no, when it comes to sword fighting it's time to have some moral hang-ups, I guess. It, I don't know, it's amazing. There's a handful of levels that don't follow the traditional modern aesthetic thing the game is doing, and they're far less interesting. The game opens in LA, and there's a grey car mechanic level that just drags on, aside from a neat moment where you go through an automatic car wash, but the worst level is later on, when Red Steel has a swing at having a madhouse game show level, with Power Rangers knockoffs to fight because, you know, it's quirky in Japanese, and, and this level is just terrible. Like, it's a level going through the motions. When Red Steel's stylistic strengths are stripped away like this, there's nothing left to mask how shoddy the gameplay otherwise is. If you slice up Red Steel into all its different pieces, no pun intended, and you examine each piece individually, each piece is either very very good or very very bad. Like, whether it's the story, the gameplay, the graphics, the individual levels, it's either very good or very bad. There's no in-between. There's, there's almost an irony to it being a tale of two halves. Like, much like the gun and the sword, uh, any aspect of Red Steel is either very harsh and abrasive, or very precise and elegant. So to circle back to how I introduced this game, I think the reason Red Steel is one of the most compelling Wii games ever goes beyond its achievements or its failings, as interesting as those things are. Uh, ultimately, Red Steel is compelling because it doesn't treat the Wii's controls or its hardware as a limitation. Like reading between the lines on pre-release interviews, I'm convinced that Ubisoft Paris thought the Wii would be more powerful than it ended up being, which explains why this game is drowning in post-processing effects and runs at 20 frames a second. Uh, the game also feels very rushed too, which, you know, can't have helped. Supposedly, Ubisoft had a PC build that they showed to certain journalists that ran far better than this final release, and lots of the bullshotted previews of the game look far better than the game ended up looking too, but more to the point, Red Steel approaches the Wii with the same idealistic excitement that we all approached the Wii with before release. Red Steel could have done its best to keep enemies in front of you, in corridors, like more of a shooting gallery, but instead it tries to be a big 360 degree shooter. Red Steel didn't have to add in grenades, crouching, sniping, a slowdown mechanic and a disarming mechanic, this game has a lot of mechanics, but it added all those in anyway, even though the controls don't really work for it. Red Steel could have made its gameplay super easy to account for the bad controls, but instead it's a game that gets super frustrating because the devs idealistically backed in their control system. Red Steel really shouldn't have had so many precise sword fighting combos and two-handed sword fighting, like the controls just aren't good enough for it, but it has those anyway because Red Steel ultimately isn't designed around what the Wii's controls are, it's designed around what they could be. It's as if Red Steel, top to bottom, was developed for the best possible version of the Wii. It has no regard for its limitations. And so Red Steel is a cautionary tale for pushing things too far, and a fascinating concept game that tried to break new ground. Where most Wii games played to the Wii's limitations or to its strengths, Red Steel played to the Wii's ambitions, and along the way it achieved a truly evocative atmosphere and style that deserves to be celebrated and recognised alongside its shortcomings. Bloody Gaijin. Speaking of games that play to the Wii's limitations, Red Steel 2 is a game that exists that came out in 2010, and it was presented with an interesting challenge, because the first game, by all reports, sold very well, but it was poorly received. The high sales numbers assumedly greenlit a Red Steel 2 and put its designers in a weird situation. Like, put yourself in their shoes and do you A, build upon or retry what the first game tried to do and just try and get it right the second time around, 
or B, put the first game behind you and use the opportunity to try and make a whole new thing because it doesn't seem like many people liked the first game anyway. If these two options were at either ends of a spectrum, Red Steel 2 skews very, very close to being option B. Ubisoft Paris basically stripped the first game all the way back to its most basic of concepts. A first person Wii game where you use a sword and a gun. That was the starting point for the first game, and it was the starting point again here. If Red Steel 1's MO was to make an immersive, groundbreaking first person experience, Red Steel 2's MO was to make a fun video gamey video game, and where you can immediately get a feel for how Red Steel 1 plays by watching gameplay, Red Steel 2's gameplay, watching it in videos like this, is a lot more abstract. You don't immediately get it in the same way. Like, it's a lot more flashy, it's a lot more anime, it's a lot more up close. It also runs at 60 frames a second instead of like 20, which is the very first thing you'll notice when you boot up the game for the first time and move the cursor around. It's just so much smoother. Recording myself playing it, look at me go, I'm swinging my arms out wide, I'm all animated, I'm looking good. You can tell I truly feel like a cool anime western samurai dude. Uh, remember when the Wii came out and we all made fun of how each other looked playing it? Ubisoft loved to be there at hardware launches. Whenever like PlayStation or Microsoft or Sony come out with a new console, Ubisoft will generally try and have at least a couple of games there for the launch lineup. Red Steel is an example of that. Uh, but a piece of hardware that wasn't a console that Ubisoft still turned up for was the Wii Motion Plus, which is this little tumor at the end of the Wiimote here. Um, you can detach it like this, and what this is, is uh, it, it's, it's, it enhances the motion capabilities and the motion tracking of the Wiimote. Um, and Ubisoft wanted to sell a game alongside this thing, and the game that they chose was Red Steel 2. Uh, Red Steel 2 didn't release alongside the Wii Motion Plus, but it was there not long after. And uh, playing Red Steel 2, you can really feel the difference, especially after playing it back to back with Red Steel 1. Like, the main difference, I think, is Red Steel 2 can tell the difference between small swings and, like, big drawn back swings. And the, the small swings in Red Steel 2 they virtually do nothing in the game. They're kind of used for like smashing boxes in the environment and that's it. They do no damage to enemies pretty much. Uh, so the game becomes all about doing these big, like dramatic, well-timed swings. Uh, and the game is so much better off for it. It's so much fun. It feels really, really good, really, really responsive. Uh, and I'm widely very impressed with the difference that uh, this little thing makes. And I think that Red Steel 2 stands as one of the best showcases for the Wii Motion Plus alongside Wii Sports Resort. And uh, yeah, generally Red Steel 2 in stark comparison to Red Steel 1 uh, feels very responsive and, and, and noticeably far more responsive than the first game. And I think that the Wii Motion Plus is largely to thank for that. The reason I'm talking about sword fighting so much is because the shooting takes a back seat here. Rather than the shootouts and the sword fighting being these two separate modes like they were in the first, they've been combined. Like, at any time you can aim your Wiimote at the screen and start shooting, and at any time you can stop aiming and just start swinging. And that's kind of remarkable in and of itself, really. Like, you don't press a button to switch between them, you just aim to aim and swing to swing. The fact that the screen doesn't go crazy when you stop or start aiming is a treat after doing anything in the first game felt like a balancing act, and thankfully Red Steel 2 barely uses the barely responsive nunchuck motion flick. The minus button reloads here, and it's so much better. The reason the screen movement doesn't feel so whack is mainly because Red Steel 2 uses a super aggressive lock onto the nearest enemy system where you press a button to switch between targets, which sounds like it could be awkward and restrictive, but it's not. It, it feels very natural. It's fine-tuned to not feel too slow or too rigid. As a whole, the combat feels like it's been play-tested and refined over and over and over. Like, it's honed down to feel far better than I can possibly explain in a video, and provided you get the hang of how it all works, landing finishes and combos here just feels fantastic. It's not perfect, mind you. It does seem to miss a swing here and there, and aiming to pop a few shots off between sword strikes can feel a bit too awkward to bother with, but generally, Red Steel 2 knows the limitations of the Wii's controls and works around them very, very well. 
Shifting your screen around to look at different enemies could be super awkward, so Red Steel 2 just uses a lock-on system. Wrangling around looking at the floor to pick up enemy weapons could also be awkward, it was in the first game, so you only use your own weapons here and never pick any up. The range of your swing in first person can feel weird with the Wiimote not tracking depth between you and your TV screen super well, so you have a super generous and natural feeling dash button to get up close to enemies. Uh, platforming in a first person Wii game is just a recipe for disaster, so you simply press the A button when prompted to jump over gaps. In stark contrast to the first game and to run the risk of repeating myself, Red Steel 2 really is all about working around the specific things the Wii can't do very well. Even the art style is tailored in such a way to not use a lot of post-processing or high-res textures. It prioritises running at 60 on the Wii of all things, while maintaining a strong aesthetic. It's a fun Saturday morning cartoon. Western tropes with a bit of Japan mixed in, hokey accents, and a silly nothingy story that isn't as earnest as the first game's was. It's all very light and bouncy, in stark contrast to the original. Uh, Tom Salter does the soundtrack again, and the sound design and soundtrack as a whole is a highlight, again. There's two games that I thought of while playing Red Steel 2. The first is Devil May Cry. These are both games where you move between combat arenas one by one, just comboing and uppercutting bad guys into the air while doing a bit of shooting on the side and getting upgrades along the way. Like both games have a very similar flow to them underneath their very different presentations and calling Red Steel 2 a first person shooter feels kind of wrong when it's this much of a hack and slash. The other game this reminds me of is Final Fight, like not really in how it plays, but Final Fight, for those who don't know, was this Capcom beat-em-up series that started in the 80s and brought with it a silly Saturday morning cartoon vibe. Its energy was always at 100, all you really do is walk through areas beating up heaps of bad guys, its aesthetic is consistent and light and being an arcade game, it was designed to be played in small bursts. It's the kind of game that you pick up and really, really vibe with immediately because it looks great and it feels great and it just has a cool vibe, but the more time you spend with it, it can get a bit much. That's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just a very one-note game. Which also describes Red Steel 2. It's always moving, always high energy, no time to breathe, combat arena followed by combat arena, the same enemy types on repeat, every area is big and open. It's hard to recall any visual set piece here, not only because the aesthetics maintain a singular mood from start to finish, something that Red Steel 1 excelled in not doing, but because the game just never stops. Fight, open a door, fight, open a door, fight, repeat, credits roll. Just follow that objective on the minimap. It's, it's a nine hour blur of orange slashing noises. And normally I wouldn't mention something this superfluous, but the doors here act as loading screens and they take forever to load. There's just so many of them. Like every time I saw a door, I could hear my internal monologue complain about it. At least they gave me time to write notes for this video, I guess. So Red Steel 2, like Final Fight, is a very charming, very solid, small burst sort of game. It's slightly over long, like towards the ninth hour, its singular tone gets a bit exhausting, and it's not too deep, the bosses especially leave a lot to be desired, and the combat feels very exploitable with some overpowered combos, but Red Steel 2 simply feels great to play, which considering that it's having a crack at being a first person Wii shooting hack and slash is a massive achievement. Like, there's so many ways that this game could have gone wrong, and the first game is proof of that, yet this is so good at what it does. As much as I wish it were paced better and it was less one note, it's hard not to admire Red Steel 2. Critics gave it solid reviews, but it wasn't really a high profile release, being a 2010 Wii sequel to a game that people don't like on a system that enthusiasts were starting to leave behind, and so it became a bit of an internet darling of a Wii game. I've heard it described as the most improved sequel ever made, but that's never sat well with me, not only because Hitman 2 Silent Assassin exists, what a game that was, but because it's just so different from Red Steel 1. It doesn't improve upon what the first game did as much as it tries to be something else, and despite how much more competent of a game Red Steel 2 is and how much more willing I'd be to recommend 
recommend it. I do find it disappointing that it didn't capitalize on the ideas and especially the aesthetics that the first game had. It's a taste thing, like 2 is easily a better game, I personally just like Red Steel 1 a bit more. Ultimately, I think Red Steel 2 exists as a response to the first game rather than a sequel. The first game just didn't know when and where to push and not push the envelope, and Red Steel 2, in response, is a masterclass in scope management. It keeps it tight, it hits that 60fps goal, it doesn't push things too far, and it makes good use of the Wii Motion Plus. It knows the hardware that it's working with inside out, and because of that, Red Steel 2 almost feels like it could be a first-party Nintendo game. To this day, it's hard to find another third-party Wii game that makes use of the Wii's capabilities as cleverly as Red Steel 2 does. Looking back on this two game series, it sort of transports me back to when motion controls were all novel and exciting. Like, remember how excited we were for the Wii? And I think the first game especially sits alongside games like Jurassic Park Trespasser and more recently a lot of VR stuff that have tried to bridge that elusive immersion gap to varying levels of success. There's no Red Steel 3, and there likely never will be. It's kind of hard to imagine what a Red Steel 3 would even look like, considering the first two are so different. So, as it stands, these now serve as these time capsules of the Wii's attempts at catering to a core gaming audience, and it'll always be hard not to appreciate both Red Steel games for their sheer ambition and their effortlessly cool style. And there we wrap up the video. Thank you for watching. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you, you know, clicked like and subscribed and belled and, you know, commented and did all the stuff that helps me out. Very much appreciated. Or you can subscribe to me on Patreon for a dollar a month just to financially support what I do. Uh, I certainly enjoyed going back to Red Steel and Red Steel 2. It felt like a real blast from the past for me. It was a lot of fun making this and it was a lot of fun hopping on camera again and doing all that. I haven't done that in a while uh, on the main channel. Uh, speaking of, I have a second channel. If you want to watch some streams, you can check those out. I was also on a podcast recently as a guest on the Crubcast, where I talk a little bit about uh, how I, why I do what I do here on YouTube, and I talk a little bit about how much I dislike Spider-Man on PS4 and how much I love Tokyo Drift because I have great taste. So you can check that out. That's linked somewhere. I should also mention that the first game has up to four player split screen. The first Red Steel game that is. Um, I just didn't find a good place to really talk about it. Um, but it's basically what you'd expect, and it's kind of awkward making playing split screen in Red Steel because, like, the controls are awkward enough as it is. Are you going to have four friends that are familiar with Red Steel's controls to make that work well? Uh, and the second game had, like, a challenge mode, but, you know, there's just not a lot to say there, so I just didn't really say anything. And, um, yeah, I think that's all the housekeeping. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you soon in another video. Goodbye.